So you guys just moved out to CR. We did, yeah. How we, are you liking it out there? It's pretty plush, really, uh, considering uh, what I've what I've been used to over this last uh, decade or so. Um, we were at uh, Eureka High School, and uh, you know, thanks to Eureka High School for for being our host uh, for these many years, but they decided to go another way. And uh, yeah, feel free to move that around. I can turn the volume up. Down yeah, give too. me a little more. Flip give me a little more me. Tell me when checking, that starts. Check a one and two and three. That's great. Thank you. Um, so yeah, they decided that they'd come to the end of the road with us, um, and so we we found that out about a year year and a half ago. And uh, so we started looking around for, you know, places to be. And uh, we are fortunate enough to have Keith Flamer, uh, who's the CR president, as a member of the Access Humboldt board. And he said, hey, we've got this building that uh, they uh, they cannot make. It used to be the old administration building, uh, but you, they can't because of the earthquake standards um, have been upgraded. They can't make students go in there. They can't hold a class. They can't make you sign up for your classes there, but they can let you guys go, but in they there. can let us go in there. And, uh, and if people want to go in of their own volition, you know, uh, that's completely fine, but they can't mandate that any, uh, any students go in there. So anyway, it is the old, uh, administration building. As I mentioned, it had the president's office in it, uh, the, uh, the boardroom for the CR board, uh, which we're now using as our TV studio and control room. Uh, and it's just, uh, mo we're only occupying a portion of it. There's still a, a huge uh, empty portion there. Um, if anybody's looking for a place to be. Are you guys planning to expand to fill out the room or what's your setup there? Do you just have one set that everybody's going to record on? Well, we, you know, uh, the thing about our old place at Access Humboldt uh, at, at, at Eureka High School is it was a purpose-built media center, right? So we went out. It didn't cost the taxpayers anything. We went out and got a grant for that. I wasn't there at the time, but uh, uh, they went out and got a grant for that um, and built out a media center with a purpose-built television studio that had a grid, you know, that you can fly your lights on. And all, all the that. bells and whistles. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so this place is not that. So we, you know, are trying to uh, recreate as best as possible. So we have um, a studio, which, like I said, as I mentioned, was the old boardroom. Uh, we have a green screen set up on one side. We've got a limbo set up on the other side. Um, and then, you know, we're running, we've always run TriCaster, uh, TriCasters. So we have a, a TriCaster set up in there with some PTZ cameras. Uh, we're kind of rebuilding that whole thing at the moment, uh, our cameras and our, our gear at the moment. But it's just kind of uh, that, that studio that we had at Eureka High on a smaller scale uh, without the, without the lighting grid, obviously. Uh, so we're taking care of it with floor lamps and, and all that kind of stuff, but it's highly functional. It does what it needs to do. And you know, the beauty of being on the CR campus, there's a lot of beauty in being in, on the CR campus, not just this, but, uh, is that if we needed to do a production size production where we had an audience, which we've done in the past, uh, at, at, at our old facility, they have beautiful, uh, I have a beautiful auditorium, uh, two, in fact, one is uh, not really in use, but they have a brand new auditorium. Um, so we could just walk across the campus with our gear and set up and, 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 you know, be in business in, in a very short period of time. So we really kind of get the best of all, of all worlds, you know, over there. So you guys kind of have a skeleton set up in the sense that the lighting's not fully there yet. Are you planning to build that out? Well, the lighting is there in that we have uh, an RE kit. Uh, and uh, so, you know, that is a complete lighting kit. So it, it, it is, it's a complete set of lights. There's, we're not, you're not wanting for anything in there. You have all uh, the necessities. Right. Uh, now, the idea would be to go to LEDs and uh, we have, we have an LED kit, but it's just not big enough really to do, you know, everything you want to do. It, it's just got three lights instead of, you know, the eight that the RE kit has in it, you know, so. Um, but we, we, we want to head in that direction. So we want to head in, in, in getting the LED using less power, less heat, and, and especially in a small combined space. But, uh, really we have everything, you know, you, you would, could want really to do. And I've, you know, uh, I've done a couple of my own 
personal productions in there. Uh, I just finished a, a, up a video for some folks from Rotary. They're doing a, a thing about uh, water, and I just finished filming uh, the presenters in there. So uh, the space is working. You know, it, 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 it does what it's supposed to do. Yeah, it seems like CR would be the perfect spot for you guys. You know, it really is. Uh, I... I the you location know, isn't quite as ideal as EHS. You're not centered that, in the community. That's true. Uh, however, I mean, there is a bus line that pulls right up in front of the place. Uh, uh, one of my uh, coworkers uh, took it from Eureka just to see, you know, if it's easy or hard or whatever, you know. And it was like 10 minutes, you know, from her bus stop to the CR bus stop. So, uh, it, you know... It is. It's on the south side of town, so you would either have to get in your car or take a bus to get down there. But, uh, you know, I don't really feel like uh, even at Eureka High, we had a huge amount of drop-ins um, more pre-COVID. So you could talk about it, our, our, us pre-COVID and post-COVID. Um, you know, a lot of things, as I'm sure you can appreciate, changed, in, uh, you know, in the two and a half years since COVID came on the scene, you know. Did you guys lose programs as a result of COVID or it was just trying to get people into the studio to create something? We did lose programs. Uh, we just, you know, people were just not, you know, venturing out and, and going to events because a lot of our um, programming that was submitted by members was event-based. So lectures or music events or, you know, uh, things that involved a lot of people being getting together. And uh, so once, you know, people stop getting together, then people stop making videos. Not completely. Uh, there, We actually got some new people, sort of some new blood in, in the COVID area, era, which are really some really fabulous stuff. Uh, but yeah, we saw a huge drop off in, uh, in, in, in member submitted videos. And, uh, you know, I tried to, uh, and to a certain extent succeeded in, uh, bringing a bunch of homegrown, uh, um, content, you know, to kind of fill out our day. And so we developed, um, a number of programs, uh, uh four programs, in fact, uh, that, you know, I kind of took it upon myself to like, you know, kind of. You know, we had an empty vessel, you know, and I'd fill it up with some stuff, you know, but that's been a great, uh, thing ongoing, uh, just because of what the programs are and who's involved and all that kind of stuff. So, um, and it has started to come back now that, now that, uh, you know, COVID's kind of easing off a little bit. People are a little more comfortable, a little going, more back comfortable outside. going out, but I mean, here's an appeal to your listeners. If you've got some video sitting on your hard drive somewhere and you uh, want to share it with the rest of Humboldt County, all you got to do is go to accesshumboldt.net and there's a submit page, a submit link. You don't even have to get up out of your chair. If it's on YouTube, we'll rip it uh, from YouTube and put it on. And uh, uh, for the television side, we don't pre-screen things. So we're not, we don't do editorial control over what people put on. So no a, content moderation, no content moderation. It's the only way that, that we could, uh, it's called prior restraint. So it's the only way that we can operate as a, as a community media center on the television side, uh, is that we don't look at it, you know, does so, that get you into trouble? What if people start releasing some crazy stuff? Well, we, I, w I wouldn't want to characterize anything that we get at Access Humble. The, we have had some some unusual uh, content in the past from people, but really, what the the the, the parameters are just the um, you, you know you don't want to slander libel anybody. Uh, you don't want to uh, um, you know it it. That's kind of really it. I mean, you, you um, copywritten material is another kind of no go, a no go area. Um, there's a third one that's escaping me at the I would moment. Assume profanity is probably up there as well. No, really, no. Uh, we do not, you know, nudity, profanity. That's all fine. Uh, Even for broadcasting on television. Well, that's the thing. See, it's not broadcast on television. It is cable cast. So uh, I guess I should back up and say we have four channels on the Suddenlink cable system. We have uh, Educate Channel 8, which is an, uh, ostensibly an educational channel. Uh, we have Civic 10, which is um, 
um, civic meetings, so Board of Supervisors, Eureka City Council, you know, you name it, Arcata City Council, all the councils, all the all the major boards are on that. Then Channel uh, 11 and 12 are sort of our free-form uh, channels. They had like one was an experimental de designation, but it's kind of – they've become – Overflow channels for a lot of the public meetings we do, but those two channels, 11 and 12, are where we will put um, member-submitted uh, material. Uh, now, I should hasten to add that you do not have to be a member of Access Humboldt to submit material to us. All you have to be is a resident of Humboldt County. And, you know, so you can, you know, like I said, uh, if people are listening to this and they say, well, I got, you know, this shot of, you know, the Timber Wars or whatever, you know, uh, that I, I would like to share with the with the with the you know our cable audience you know uh, we, we'll take that uh, now as far as say nudity and profanity goes uh, we do observe safe harbor right so meaning safe harbor is um, between the hours of eleven p.m. and and five a.m. so the idea of safe harbor was I think was really is that kids are not up you know, uh, watching television, see something uh, they shouldn't see, uh, see something they shouldn't see. Now in the world that we live in, of course, you know, it's, it's kind a different of, story. It's kind of a ridiculous in the age of the internet. Yeah. It's kind of a real ridiculous when their smartphone, you know, can, can bring them just about anything they want. You know, uh, it's kind of a, kind of a ridiculous outmoded concept, but uh, you know, there's a lot in ridiculous and outmoded about us. So, uh, we, 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 we stick to that. Um, so we would put that material on later at night. And, you know, the, the idea, of course, is that, you know, say if something was graphically violent, you know, you wouldn't want that to come on at the dinner time where people are sitting down having their dinner or what have you, you know. So um, it's just kind of a conceit. But there really is no prohibition on it. Yet. I guess if it were straight porn, you know. That uh, might be a different story. Might be a different story. It, you know, there's that whole thing about its obscenity, its community tastes, you know, what, what the community will bear and support and, or throw away or and reject, you know? So, um, sometimes there's kind of a fine line between, between that stuff, but honestly, we really don't have a lot of problems in those areas. I think of um, the members of Axis Humboldt and the people so that submit to the channels are very conscientious and they're very serious about what they're, what they're presenting because they have to sign off on it. So this is the other thing is that, you know, when they offer something up to the channels, they sign a form stating that they understand the terms and conditions, uh, that it doesn't have the copyright and that it doesn't have the, uh, the libel or slander, slander in it, you know, uh, and if something goes wrong, well, you know, it bounces off of us and sticks to you like glue, right? You know, so uh, that is the way, um, you know, we handle it. And honestly, I can only think of like one or two examples in the, in the uh, well, 11 years that I've been in Access Humble that, that we've really had anything uh, going down. Oh, I know what the other, th what the third thing is, non-commercial. So everything that goes on the channels needs to be of a non-commercial nature. You can't make a car, uh, use car, you know, commercial Promo. for your brother-in-law or yeah. what have you. Um, now, that's not to say that you couldn't say, you know, that, that, that it exists, but you couldn't say, you know, we, you couldn't say like, you know, we have the best tacos in town, come down there, two ninety nine, you know, sort of thing. You could say you could do like a piece and people have done pieces in the past on restaurants and, you know, maybe sort of a review sort of thing, you know, but that's different than, than, uh, that call to action, you know, where you're, you're asking people to come down and, and, and buy what we're selling, you know? So, yeah. So the non-commercial, uh, is the other nature. Now let's say you were an author and you were doing, a uh, a video on the topic that you wrote your book on, you know, you could mention that you have a book. You could mention where, if you're interested in finding it, you know, here's where you go. Here's my website or here's a phone number. Uh, that's where you would go to, to, to get, uh, to find it, you know? So instead of saying, here's my book, it's thirty nine ninety five. Yeah. You know, call me directly. Check money, yeah. Check or money order. I'll take ma all major credit cards. So we, that, that, that's kind of the, the, the third thing that I was trying to think of. I think that's great in the sense that the limitations and the ease of access are there. 
you d- you're not censored. You can kind of say whatever you want to say. You can do what you want to do. Put out whatever content you want to put out. Mm-hmm. And there's no real overhead or oversight on that. We, you know, we, uh, somebody smarter than me called it a digital soapbox. And, you know, the, so Access Assembled has been around uh, since 2006, I think it is, is when we uh, made our um, deal with the county and with Cox Communications at the time. Um, and so much has happened. I don't, you know, I don't have to tell you what's happened in, since 2006 in, you know, the, the, uh, revolution of smartphones. It's a different and, world today. Yeah. And the internet, of course, existed, but it, you know, it wasn't the thing that it is today. And so that has involved us, you know, kind of, uh, you know, reevaluating what, you know, what our purpose is and what, you know, how we can help people, uh, you know, realize what it is they're trying to realize, you know, uh, in a different way than it used to be when you, you know, we had cameras for rent, which we still do. Uh, and that was, you know, the only thing you could get really, you know, you, you would either, you know, buy a camcorder or you know, maybe have one or, you know, something like that. Um, or you could use our, our gear, you know? Um, so in today's day and age, um, there are still people out there that believe it or not, do not own a smartphone that still want to do stuff like this, you know? Uh, but it's not the same sort of urgency i would say that 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 we used used to have in that department would you guys say you're more of an aggregator of content today well, because in the past you had to you had ag- to go through the television because there was no internet sure sure I, when i when i hear the word aggregator i think of something like loco you know that that where they go out and they pull things and they bring them in, right? So they make a decision, right, to 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 put things on their platform. We don't make those decisions. We're we're just a mindless jellyfish blob, like right, the people put their give put their stuff in. So we don't select, you know, other than the stuff that we produce on our own. We do not select things to put on the channel. So that that that's why I wouldn't call us an aggregator. Yeah, I guess aggregator isn't the correct term. It would be you're more of a landing site for the content. Yeah. Just a place where it exists freely. Yeah. We also maintain a, a, an archive community media archive on archive.org. Um, so that's another way of, you know, you know, I, I teach classes up there and uh, I get my students in and I tell them, you know, and like we were talking, I think maybe before we started about, you know, you're, you're doing video and, and stuff like that. Uh, you know, you can make the best pancakes in the world, but if you make them at the bottom of the ocean, you know, who's going to know about it, right? So you want to get it on as many different platforms as possible. Uh, Archive.org is a really cool organization. I don't know how familiar you are with them, but they, you know, um, unlike YouTube, they don't, you know, monetize your videos. Uh, um, YouTube, uh, you know, uh, they they do what they do and that's great, but also they can change their terms and conditions on a whim, and you know, pull content on a whim. They can pull I've content. They could decide, okay, well we're only taking ten minute videos now, or you know what's which is what they started with. But you know they can they 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 can change their their private company. They can change their conditions. Whereas archive dot org, you put it up on archive, it's going to be there for you know forever is it a long-term archival site as well yes then? Okay. Yeah. in fact they run this thing called the wayback machine which basically has uh websites from history so you could go back and you could look at ibm's website from 1998 oh that's cool you know? so they that's one of the things they do they have this uh thing called the prelinger collection which is um all this um uh, public domain films so if you wanted like, you know, health films from the 60s and 70s or, you know, just somebody's home movies that they've socked up there. Uh, but if you wanted, you know, uh, or old movies that are out of, you know, out of uh, they're no longer copywritten or their copyright right is expired or nobody, you know, uh, they're not in circulation. Yeah. Anymore. Um, where you can just go and pull that stuff off and use it any way you want to You can cut it up and, you know, mix it up and stuff. So. You know, it's just a few of the things they do. Uh, they're they're just a really am- an amazing organization. So, I, I archive dot org. I really another suggestion for your listeners is to, is to check them out. I'll have to look into them. I've not heard of that site. Yeah, 
So we have that archive. We do have a YouTube channel. So we, you know, um, things that, um, you know, get if submitted all, you know, end up on YouTube as well, because again, you want to get it out there to all these different things, uh, different spots that you possibly can. So the nice thing about the, R, uh, the archive.org too, is you can get an RSS feed and you can subscribe to it just like, you know, you could, if you were subscribing to somebody's, you know, podcast from a commercial site and that's all free. You know, so um, a lot to recommend it. Huh. I can, that's cool that that's out there. I've not heard of that. Check it out. Yeah, yeah. I'll have to. I like that. Do they do any censorship? No. no. That's perfect. Mm -hmm. If they do, I'm not aware of it. I mean. They're not I'm as heavy handed, at least as YouTube. They, I don't think, I think they're kind of like us. I don't think they look at what the content is, right? If they got complaints about the content. They might. I mean, they might was that specific it. with Access Humboldt? Was that a choice not to censor? Or was that a requirement in order to be this it's community? It's a requirement to be. This is the way uh, people that run public access television channels throughout the country, that's that's the way they all have to operate. Because if you, you know, you would have to retain counsel. You know, you would have to have somebody on staff that would review Every everything. Every hour there's of just, footage. Yeah, there's just not enough hours in the day for our small staff to do that or any small staff in a generally underfunded, you know, community media center scenario. You it's know. not realistic. No, it isn't. So, yeah. So it, it's kind of standard in the industry, yeah. And how did you find Access Humboldt? How did you come on board? Well, uh, I can go way back to uh, uh, being a communications major uh, in, in college. I took radio and TV production, did, uh, you know, I was a DJ on, um, on the college radio station. So I had an interest in media back then. Uh, I took a, a number of detours into, into other careers uh, as my, you know, got married and had kids and do all that kind of stuff out of mortgage. So I had to, you know, kind of... Um, you know, pay the bills, yeah. uh, have the day job. I was a musician. I was a recording engineer. I did a lot of, I did a lot of crazy stuff, uh, in my life. Uh, but, um, when the, uh, and just, I'll just say that I, I worked in the insurance industry, uh, for many years and, uh, we specialized in, uh, home builders and, uh, and, uh, remodeling contractors. So you can imagine like right about 2008, what happened to that market? Yeah. Not a good time to it be involved. Just, it disappeared. And honestly, uh, by that time I was pretty much done with it. I, I mean, I, I, it was nice to make good money and all that kind of stuff, but I never really felt at home in that industry. I never, I don't play golf. I, you know, I, 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 you know, I, I just, I, I felt like a little, a little imposter syndrome thing, you know, even though I, we did well and it was, it was fine. But anyway, uh, I had been a, uh, Keat volunteer at the public television station here, uh, for a long time. I had probably been at, by that point, I had probably been a volunteer for like 15 years or something like that. So I was very involved in, in the station. Uh, I did all the pledge drives. I did the, uh, the auctions. I, you know, I worked on, um, you know, productions and, and, and things like that where they needed help. Um, and so, uh, they needed a production assistant. One of the production assistants, Wes, uh, was retiring and they needed somebody. So I, I got hired as a production assistant. So I went to work for key TV and I was there for three years, uh, just to shorten this whole story. Uh, after about three years, things, uh, kind of came to an end there. And, uh, somebody said, Hey, I see that Axis Humboldt is hiring. And I knew about them. I had met Sean and I'd been to their, their, their site and, and, you know, uh, was an admirer, you know, I, I, what they did. So I went down and, uh, they interviewed me and, uh, two weeks later I was working for him. So, uh, you know, that's where I started. So that would, that was, oh, like 2012, 11, 12, somewhere in there. So, yeah. So that's how I got to Axis Humboldt. And it's been a great ride. It's really been terrific. Uh, you know, a lot of the things that uh, I 
didn't feel like I was getting allowed to do up at Key TV. I got to do at Access Humble. I got to direct live television. I, you know, I have, I got to found a radio station, you know, uh, or be a part of finding, founding a radio station, which is not something that many people can claim in, in the world. Um, and just working with a really dedicated crew of people um, and feeling like, you know, we are making a difference. Um, you know, a lot of what Access Humble does is support the nonprofit community. Um, we work, you know, with the DIY thing is, 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 is important to us. So members doing their own thing and us giving them the guidance and the tools and all that sort of thing to do it is important, but we also work as a production company. So we get hired, uh, by nonprofits to, to, um, realize the projects that they're doing. Right. So being involved in those things has really been rewarding. And, uh, you know, we do education, so we do workshops and, uh, we worked, um, we haven't really done them lately. I COVID kind of put an end to a lot of that, but uh, we work with a lot of kids that maybe never get a chance to do this kind of stuff. So we worked in down in Lolita and down in Fortuna, and I, you know, I'll tell you this story. I probably, I, it's going to sound really, uh, I don't know, self-aggrandizing, maybe I don't know, uh, but I ran into a. Um, uh, a friend of mine who who ran one of the, the centers, a youth center. Actually, it was a multi generational center, but they had programs for youth. And we did a couple of uh, workshops over the years uh, down there, uh, digital um, uh, iOS iOS workshops. So you know everything was iPad based, uh, you know uh, phones and iPads and all that kind of stuff, and work with the kids down there. And um, her son uh, was. Um, at the time, uh, sort of, um, ha was having some, I don't want to say behavioral problems. I don't know if that's the word, the way to put, put it, but he was just really not into us. You know, uh, it seemed like at first, uh, and, but over the course of this workshop that, w that was three days, he kind of like warmed up and it was like, he was, by the time we got to the end of it, he w was way into it. Right. And it's just like, this is so cool. And so anyway, I saw her, uh, just last week and she said, I just wanted to let you know that my son is now majoring at film at humble at, at Cal Poly Humboldt. And he says the reason he did that was because of the workshop that we did. Like, like it just, you know, it turned on some sort of, you know, light in him, you know, and he just decided that, Hey, this is something I want to pursue. And I, you know, I was floored by that. I was just, I mean, you don't get that kind of feedback really that often, you know? And, uh, it, and it, it just said to me that, uh, you know, the, the workshop that myself and Juan Carrillo, uh, or who's our production manager did down there, you know, it, it affected people and it, and it changed somebody's life, you know, even if it was only one person, you know, uh, and that, that's a really good feeling, you know? And so, you know, I, just me personally, I, I just try and start off with, you know, how can we help? You know, it's like a lot of the way I approach things when somebody comes to me with something, it's like, okay, let's figure out how we can make this happen for you, you know? And, uh, how you can realize what it is you want to realize, you know? So that's a lot of our function. And I, you know, I feel like, you know, we should be moving more in that direction, which is supporting, uh, people who have an idea, they have the drive, uh, to do it. Right. And, uh, then we fill in the gaps with the training and gear and, uh, and just, you know, the cheerleading, maybe, you know, uh, sometimes that's all people need is just like somebody say, good job. And yeah, go for just it. Just that support. Yeah. Um, and, you know, in, in, as I was talking about in the moving away from, you know, how technology has moved on and everybody's got a television production uh, um, in their pocket, you know, that's kind of where we can uh, feel, you know, that's kind of where we can get into that point because, it's one thing to take video. It's another thing to make it render it out artfully and making it compelling for people to want to watch. And, you know, uh, my, my test when I talk to my students is like, you know, the, the, the first question you have to ask yourself is, is it boring? You know, you don't want it to be boring. You want it to be something that's uh, going to get engage somebody on some level. Right. Uh, and either however you, 
care to do it using, you know, fancy camera angles or humor or, you know, just information or what have you, you know? So, um, but yeah, that, you know, that's kind of like, like where I feel we should be going anyway. Do you feel like you guys aren't going in that direction or weren't moving in that direction in the past? And that's a void you, you now see as important. Well, it's not that I think that we're not moving in that direction. I think we are, uh, but it was kind of a different model pre COVID. Um, basically anyone, and this is sort of still true. Anyone could come in and sit in front of our computers for all the hours that were open and never turn in any programming. Uh, I had, I had members who rented cameras all the time and for years and never turned in a single program. Right. And the reason, one of the reasons that we rent equipment and that we make editing stations available and that we have a television station is first of all, for you to create what you want to create. Right. And, and, and realize your dream. But secondly, it's not completely altruistic. We need content. We are content hungry. You know, we've got four television channels, 24, seven, 365. That's a lot of air to fill. You, that's right. Add it up. Right. So, uh, one of the things that we want you to do when you use our equipment is to create content for the channels. Right. So we had a fair amount of people that never did that. And I just felt, I, sometimes feel, uh, and maybe that was important. Maybe, maybe we fulfilled a function, you know, uh, beyond what we, you know, we saw as a zero sum, you know, but, uh, I kind of feel like that people who have the drive and initiative and the ideas and everything, those are the people who should be higher up on the priority list, right. Than than the people who just, you know, kind of, this is going to sound terrible, but just kind of sort of take up that space that maybe somebody who really wants to create could be taking it or take up the attention that we give to them. Um, you know, we should be giving to someone who, you know, really is interested in, 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 in realizing something, you know, isn't just creating content in a vacuum. Yeah. I mean, if for some people, if they were to create any content, I mean, it's like, again, there's no judgment on our part. We don't say, oh, this is good or bad. You know, we, we're not we're not looking at it and giving it a letter grade or anything else like that. Uh, it's just the fact that if you created it, if it's either create or don't create, right? You know, uh, if you're not creating something, you know, then why? You know, and what can we do? You know, what can we do to help you uh, figure out what it is you want to create, you know? one of the things that would often happen would be people would come in with really grandiose plans. They would really have their version of war and peace or whatever that they wanted to do. Apocalypse now, you know, we're going to blow up a village. We're going to do this, you know, uh, we're going to drive cars off of cliffs and you know, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and then when they got down to actually doing it, uh, they realized two things. Well, the first thing is, Hey, this is actually work. Right. There's That's the big there, one. There's That's actual the one. work involved. Right. And then the, the second thing is often that not everybody has your vision. Uh, if you're trying to attract people to help you do what you want to do, they may not be as, you know, hot about it as you you are. Right. You know, and so mostly it's the work. Mostly it, it, it's the fact that, hey, this is this is an involved thing. It just doesn't fall together. And I think people that watch a lot of media, I mean, we binge television now, right? We can watch an entire series, an output of a series in, an, in a single day, right? And and people, I think there's a disconnect there because people don't say, they just think it magically appears, right? But each one of those episodes, I say they're an hour long, that involved a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of people working on it, you know? Uh, and, and to, to pop that out. And then you've just gone through it in a single day and you feel like, well, anybody can do that. Right. It just, it just falls together. And honestly, that's not the way it works. You know, there, it, it really is hard. And so one of the things that, you know, I try to impress upon people, you know, in my classes is like, hey, let's look at the functions of what, you know, television is. There's a producer and maybe an executive producer and there's a director and there's a, production assistant and there's an audio guy and there's, and you may be all of them, right? You may be every one of those things, but it's important to know that they exist 
as separate jobs, right? So because somebody's got to do those jobs, right? And 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 if it's only you, you know, you've got to buckle only, up. It's going to take yeah, a while. Exactly. You know. So, um, what I you know what I've seen over the years is just people that have they're just overly ambitious and and they have good ideas. They've got it all formulated in their heads, you know, and stuff like that. And they think it just should just pop out. And uh, backing, backing up to, to classes, um, you know, we taught a, um, a studio class and hopefully we'll get back to that soon. Um, and so we would teach people how to run, uh, all of the, run the cameras and run the switcher and run the audio gear and mic people up and turn on the lights and make sure people are properly lit. But then, you know, people would not get a, uh, a chance to ever use those skills again, right? Unless they came back and did their own production. And, you know, it's kind of like a muscle. I mean, you, you got to exercise. Oh, you can lose it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you know, you take a class and you're in the class for four hours and then you come back six months later and it's like, oh, well, what am I supposed to do? Um, so what we did is we had this thing called Media Lab that we did every 60 days that I would love to get back to, but what I tried to do was show people how a show could be produced, right? So we did like, we had a game show. We did a game show called Guess My Gig. And uh, so we had like, you know, uh, there was a t television show that you're too young to remember, I'm sure it's called What's My Line, right? And basically come people come in and they ask questions and try and figure out what people do for a living, right? Or what their hobby is and stuff like that. So we did a game show. We did an, like an adult puppet show. We did an, an open mic type show. We've done, I've done like a, a Bob Ross painting show with a friend of mine who's a watercolorist, you know, and we put all these shows together to, to show people what it takes, right? To produce a show. I mean, I even did a show where, uh, I said, you produce the show. I'll be the executive producer. I'll be your showrunner, and I'll, you know, you, or you be the showrunner. I'll be your executive producer, you know, and, and, you know, you can find out what it takes to, to put a show together. Well, I didn't end particularly well. I ended up, I ended up being the showrunner. I ended up, do, you know, doing all that kind of stuff. But the idea is to, you know, give people an idea what it takes to do uh, a, a TV show, you know? So, um, I think that's important. I think it's important that people understand what's involved, right? Because I don't think a, a lot of people who could have the technology in their pocket now don't really understand, uh, what it takes. And that's where we can be helpful. I agree. And don't understand that they could do it, that it is possible. There's mm -hmm. no barrier of entry anymore, especially if you have that phone, you can create the content. It's just going to require a little bit of discipline, a little bit of patience and a lot of hard work, but yeah. you can do it. You can create whatever you want to create today. Yes, you can. Uh, there's really no barrier. There's so many low cost, no cost tools out there. There's really no excuse for, for, and the knowledge too. the knowledge base is there as well. Uh, I mean, if you, you know, we use a, a program called final cut pro, which we use, that's our platform of choice for editing there are so many tutorials online right you can just go people people ask us well do you have classes in final cut pro you know you're like uh, yeah it's called youtube well it's called youtube it's also called doing it right it's also called just messing around with it you know and one of the things i have a hard time sometimes with people doing is i've said you know just do a three minute video just like get you know go out and get some material get your cat do it, something about your cat right and, and don't try and start big and just learn the tools and make your mistakes and see what work and see what doesn't work. And, uh, you know, so that's another one of my mantras is like, start small, you know, figure it out. And, you know, we're there to help. We, we, we're there to offer advice. Um, but what we won't do is do it for you. Right. We, 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 unless people you don't, pay us, people you don't pay like us. that though. They want to come and they want to, they want to know how to do it and be taught how to do it and then still have you do it for them. Well, there's that. And, you know, the other thing I find a lot is that people are afraid. They're afraid of the technology. They're afraid. I, I don't know where this comes from exactly. Jane, stop this crazy thing. You know, uh, they, they're afraid that they're going to mess something up. Uh, they're going to break something. Oh, okay. You know, uh, and, and, you know, the thing with, uh, 
video editing nowadays is it's non-destructive. You really can't mess things up. You could delete, I guess you could delete your, your project, which people have done, uh, you know, but uh, you could take, you know, there are precautions for that. But, you know, there's really not, uh, you know, there's not nothing to worry about, you know, but I do find that people are worried that they're, that they're somehow going to break something or, there are gaps in their knowledge about basic sort of computer literacy. So I, I taught and nothing against seniors because, you know, I'm an old guy too. Uh, but um, I, I taught this class, uh, an Ollie class, which is up, up at uh, what was Humboldt State and now it's Cal Poly, uh, um, uh, video editing for seniors, right? And uh, the seniors that I taught they had no familiarity with shortcuts. So they didn't know control Z is undo. They didn't know control C was copy. They didn't know control V is, is paste. Right. And so they're trying to do this stuff without that basic knowledge. Right. And so it got really frustrating for them, you know, so a lot of what I ended up doing in that class was teaching just basic computer literacy. You know, these folks are of a certain uh, era, you know, they grew up in a pre-digital, pre-personal computer age, and you know that none of that was ever necessary. Uh, so, you know, they don't, they have gaps in their knowledge. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. And and so there are, you know, folks. Sometimes folks just don't want to admit that they don't know stuff. You know, um, and it's embarrassing, or it's you know, they just they feel inadequate or what have you. And they're not, there's, there's nothing wrong with not knowing that, that control V is paste. Right. Uh, but there is something wrong with n not wanting to, you know, find Do out, about you know? It. Uh, so anyway, I didn't know where, I don't know where I was going with that other than, other than to say that there are reasons why even in today's world, there are, you know, people that, maybe have ideas and maybe want to do something, but they still just don't have those basic tools, uh, you know, in their toolkit to, to make it a reality. You know? What is the biggest factor limiting people from putting out that content? If they come see you and they start and they want to do it, is it their idea is too big? They don't know how to, how to fulfill it. They get burnt out because of the workload. What, what stops that final creation aspect? Hmm. I, I mean, I think it's a case by case really basis. Um, you know, a lot of it is just people are busy, you know, and they just get taken away from it. I, you know, I know people that have started projects and, and then they just, you know, life takes over and, you know, with the best, they started with the best of intentions and, and then, you know, something happens, you know, and then they, they never come back to it, you know. But I don't know. I mean, we try to make the barrier really low. Uh, as far as like renting gear from us, it's so cheap. I mean, we've talked about raising our rates and stuff like that. They've basically been the same since the, we started in 2006. It's just an incredibly, it's incredibly cheap to do. Uh, so it's often, it's not money. And the other thing about that is that even if it were a, a question of money, I, I will scholarship people. I will, I will give them a membership. I will, uh, comp them the, uh, the, the gear if they show that willingness and that drive and initiative to turn in some content. Right now we used to have a, a contract basically that said, you will turn in content. You will, you know, and here's the dates, you know, and all this kind of stuff like that. Uh, we kind of got away from that because it just seemed like a little too authoritarian and we it's a little aggressive. Yeah. Uh, and you know, we're nice people. We don't want to, you know, be busting people's chops, you know, that's not what we're about. Uh, but you know, getting back to what I was saying before, some people need their chops busted. You know, some people need that kick in the, uh, posterior to, to, you know, get them going. You know, I do too. I mean, I, I, sometimes I just, usually I'm, I'm kicking myself in the ass, but, uh, but sometimes you just need somebody to light a fire under you, you know, and just remind you, Hey, you committed to do this. And, you know, but I, you know, I understand you got stuff going on, but let's try and let's kind of try and figure it out. You know, let's reason together, you know, and try and figure out uh, what, what we need to do to get, get it happening. You know, what does it cost to rent some equipment? It, is for, there a membership aspect where you can just is. be a member and there, use it? There is. A, there is. 
So uh, the membership for Access Assemble is twenty five dollars a year. Uh, it's pretty expensive. Yeah, that's terrible, isn't it? Yeah, that's like how many lattes is that? And that gives uh, you full access to all of your guys' equipment. Gives you access to uh, the editing facilities and also to the classes. So and once you're a member, then you can sign up for classes. So uh, so to rent video gear, um, well, actually in audio gear too, it's $5 a day, $10 for three days, $20 a week. Oh, that's a great deal. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. And in, in, in addition to video kits, we also have podcasting kits. So if you wanted to, you know, create a podcast, we have, uh, you know, a, a, a digital recorder, uh, mics, mic stands, headphones, you know, all that kind of stuff uh, that you can set up, you know, and, and do your own podcast like we're doing here today. That's actually how I came across you and through Access Humboldt was I saw you guys were offering podcast classes yep. on how to do that. I thought mm-hmm. that was great. Yeah. Yeah, I teach that class. I, I teach all of the classes. I, um, but yeah, we we have that. We've gone through a couple of different iterations of it, uh, of the kits. But now I think we have a pretty solid kits uh, for that kind of stuff. And it's really pretty easy. Um, I um, I went I went up and trained uh, kids up at the Six Rivers Charter School up here in Arcata. And they turned out some great podcasts. I, I, they were journalism students, so they are already, they're already there, right? So they, they, you know, I have no responsibility other than just showing them, hey, this is how you plug this in. This is how you turn this on, you know, that kind of thing, you know. But, uh, you know, so, yeah, it, it, you know, I'm a radio guy. Um, I was uh, at KHSU for a really long time. I had a show for over 20 years. Uh, there and I also still have a show. I still have a radio show down at K Mud, so I do do a show down there. So I'm very big on radio and uh, and I don't know. We haven't talked about radio yet, but we, we have. That's uh, a great segue. Okay, I I want to I want to kick that off with the censorship aspect though, because yeah. radio is definitely a little more heavy handed. It's different. Yeah. Yeah. What's your take on that? Well, uh, we um, you know we have uh, to work with the FCC. And the FCC says no seven dirties, right? So, you know, you, the George Carlin routine, you know, uh, you, you can't say these things on the radio, right? So that's our, that's our jumping off point for what goes on the radio. Secondly, you know, uh, I feel a little bit like I have a responsibility to give accurate information to the, uh, as the station manager, I have a responsibility to give accurate information to the community. So, you know, I've been approached by people who, um, you know, are interested in like, especially during COVID, you know, that are interested in unproven and possibly unsafe, you know, cures and present preventatives, you know, wanting to do shows about them. And I'm just like, you know, show me the peer review science and we're good. Right. You know, uh, I am not going to put out things that confuse people. Right. That, you know, especially, you know, radio audiences tend to be a little older, you know, and all that sort of thing, Uh, you know, then they get conflicting information. Right. So. um, So that's another thing is it's like I if you're going to do a show uh, on on KCZH, um, you know, I you're going to need to be responsible uh, and and, you know, clear eyed about what it is you're doing, you know. There's plenty of other outlets like I've had I've had to tell people, you know, you know, just take it to the TV side. Just, you know, you could go over to our TV channels and you could say anything you want about anything you want, you know, Uh, and and, uh, that would be fine. We would never question that. But on the radio, I feel like I have a responsibility to to the listeners of the station to 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 give accurate information. Do you ever struggle with that role of trying to determine what is accurate? I mean, especially with COVID when the information was changing so fast, yeah. did you struggle with sure. what is right and what is right for right now? Absolutely. Uh, but you know, you can only rely, uh, rely on the experts, you know? So like we had Dr. Hoffman on a lot, who was the public health o- officer for Humboldt County. And even he was going through this thing where things were, it was a changing moving target, you know, and stuff like that. As, as, as we found out more about, I mean, I hear people complain about, well, you know, people said X, Y, Z about COVID when it first came out and it turned out not to be true. It's like, well, yeah, we didn't know anything about it, right? Nobody, I mean, or they did, but I mean, 
they really didn't have a good handle on what the disease was and how it was transmitted and all these other kinds of things and what would stop its transmission and, you know, vaccines and all that stuff. So it was kind of information developed as you went along, you know. So, but yeah, so we just tried to rely on the experts, you know. Uh, we would just try and get the people who, you know, know what they're talking about, you know, or they should know what they're talking about. They're in a position which says that they know what they're talking about. Was that always 100% accurate? I, I'm sure you could probably ask them and they would say, hey, well, we didn't know this on, you know, in February, what we knew in March, right? So, you know, you could not just do the best you can. I mean, that's really, uh, that's really all you, all you can do. But yeah, I mean, I haven't really been put in a position more than a couple of times about, you know, like, here's my, you know, theory about xyz and why won't you put it on the radio um you know uh, that hasn't really happened that much you know maybe it will as we start to you know kind of uh gather steam and get to be well known it's you know it's been a it's been kind of a hard slog uh to get like any media attention from our fellow <laughs> our fellow media People have not uh, fallen over themselves to like, you know, put a shine a spotlight on us uh, that much. But, uh, um, but yeah, uh, you know, one of the things that, you know, one of the reasons the, the radio station got started in the first place was that, um, you know, f to get public meetings, to, to participate in your democracy, you had to have cable television or you had to have a broadband hookup. You know, so we started the station with the idea that, hey, we'll put on public meetings, we'll put them on the radio. So anybody with a transistor radio that's in our listening area can listen to it. Right. And so that was our jumping off point for that. And then we moved into things like we when we were on the campus of Eureka High School, we, we were doing student voices. So we work very closely over the years with the media production class, which is sadly no longer there. Uh, because, you know, that's the way they do things over there. But um, uh, so we we had student voices. So we had, you know, kids developing their own uh, uh, you know, voices, you know, pod podcasting and, and, and interviewing each other and just trying stuff out. And we put that stuff on the radio. And, uh, you know, and so it has moved into, and then, in 2016, uh, the university uh, gutted KHSU uh, and really deprived the community of a huge resource. Uh, um, there was a lot of public affairs, local public affairs programming that just got wiped off the face of the earth, right? Uh, just thrown in the trash can. And so at that point, uh, I one of the things that I made my reason for being was to try and bring a lot of that back. And we have succeeded in doing that, you know, so we have things like eco news and we have uh, um, we we developed a uh, community calendar, which was a really important piece of their day um, and various other shows. And in fact, I'm bringing back a show called Thursday Night Talk, which is a talk show that uh, was on for, you know, 35 years on KHSU, you know, um, so we tried to make it a home for people that were doing public affairs programming. So that came into play. And so that, you know, kind of led to us accepting programming from other people, from like podcasters and, you know, uh, you know, people that are just developing their own stuff, you know. So that's kind of where we are today is we, you know, we, <clears throat> you know, I'm always looking for content. I mean, people like see me coming and it's like, oh, here he comes again. He's going to ask me for, content. he's going to ask me to be on the radio or something, you know. Uh, but you know, again, I have 24 seven to fill and you know, I got a schedule to fill and you know, I, I need stuff to go in there. You know, it's just, it's just a plain fact that I got to fill out a 24 hour broadcast day. Right. So, um, yeah, so I'm always looking for people that might want to, uh, you know, do radio shows and, you know, this move to CR has been really fortuitous in that respect because there's a whole new group of people that we can call upon, you know. And a younger Smart, generation. Younger generation. Uh, Academy of the Redwoods, you know, is up there. Uh, their high school outlet, you know. So, yeah. So, there's a whole new bunch of people I can bug, you know, <laughs> for now, content. Now, with the radio, you said the seven seven deadly words. Seven, seven deadly dirty C's, words. Yeah, seven, seven dirty words. Yeah. 
What is that? Uh, you want me to recite them? Yeah. Do you I know? think it's uh, shit, fuck, piss, motherfucker, cocksucker. Is that six? And tits. Tits is. It, you can't I, say tits on the I radio. I guess not. Oh, piss. Did I say piss? So that's seven. Yeah. So those are the only seven words you can't say on yeah. the radio? Yeah. That's the, that's, those are the ones that, that, that are the hot button words. Although I see, hear people say pissed off all the time, you know, and of course there's the bird called the tit, you know, so what do you, what happens when you say that? Does, does the wheels fall off of the thing? I don't know. But, uh, but yeah, you basically, we just want to avoid F bombs, you know? Um, now why, why that? Why was the line drawn there? <laughs> That's the million dollar question. Yeah, right? Commun- community standards. I think it was Justice Stevens who said, "I, uh, I don't know what obscenity is, but I know it when I see it." Right, and so there was this case that uh, George Carlin uh, versus the FCC, uh, where uh, he tested that theory, and it went all the way to the Supreme Court uh, about what was considered uh, unsuitable for broadcast. Um, again, that's kind of gone by the wayside. Uh, I mean, if you look at like our former president, you know, said all kinds of crazy stuff on, on, on live into a mic, you know, uh, I don't think he got fined or anything else like that, but, um, but yeah, so those are things what you don't want to do, I think as a broadcaster is just attract unwarranted attention. Uh, Somebody could complain about it. And, you know, then you would have people investigating you and trying to figure out, you know, if you know what you're doing and all that kind of stuff. And they might find out that you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> but Story uh, of my life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. So we, we, we want to studiously avoid those sorts of things. And then, again, libeling and slandering. Uh, libel is printing and slander is broadcast or saying out loud, I think. I might have that backwards. I probably do. Uh, but yeah, you want to, you know, that's another thing you want to avoid. You don't want to say, you know, Joe Jones is beats his wife or, you know, that kind of stuff. You you, just make shit up. Yeah. Just make shit up, which I guess is a a, a whole industry now. It's been an industry for a while. It's definitely popularized now. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of money in that, by the way. So just for your listeners, for your listeners out there, if they, they're looking for a new career, they could get into making shit up. But, uh, um, yeah, so we, yeah, we don't, gotta we watch just, out for that. We, we, we got to watch out for that. The other biggie is hourly IDs. We need to tell the folks that they're listening KZZH 96.7 Eureka, California. You have to say that. Have to say that every hour. It's a violation if you do not. Now, why does, why is that a factor? Well, I think is that it's in a practi- case you say something bad, people know who. Well, yeah, Yes. And I think, I think that's part of it, but I think that they, you know, I think it's useful actually to know that it's a useful bit of information where you're listening to something, you hear a program that you really like, you know, and what, what, what station was that? You know, so oh, K's, K's easy age. Um, but yeah, I think it is that you, you identify yourself and you take responsibility for what you're putting out, you know? So I think that's why that's a very old, that goes back to the 1930s. So that they, they've been doing that for a long time. But yeah, that's one of the things that you can get a violation for is not, is not. That's doing so it. crazy. I mean, it just seems so arbitrary. Do you see the FCC loosening some of these roles because radio is now competing with the internet and anything goes in the, I mean, TV is as well. Everything's competing with the internet and the internet has no gloves. Well, what I see is that the enforcement arm of the FCC has been gutted, Right. So it, it almost, in some ways, it doesn't matter what, well, it matters what people do. But, I mean, it, it, it's harder for them to, you know, keep, keep right herd on it, really, I think. More but they it. still have the option to enforce. They still have those regulations are still on the books. Um, there was a Digital Copyright Act. I don't know if you're familiar with that. was uh, um, sometimes known as the Sonny Bono Act. I don't know. Sonny and Cher. I don't know. I'm drawing I know a Sonny blank. Cher, yeah. I, I'm drawing a blank look. But Sonny Bono was a he was a congressman from California for a long time. Died by skiing into a tree. Uh, but anyway, it, they he shepherded this thing through uh, this horrendous bill. Um, it's one of the reasons why we're so. 
uh, big on not putting copyrighted material on because that's a violation as well of that act. And, um, and in fact, when I was at KHSU, um, they would not let us play more than three songs in a row of the same artist because that violated the Digital Copyright Act. So like if somebody died and you wanted to do a tribute to someone, you could not play three of their songs in a four-hour period. A four-hour period? Four-hour period, yeah. So, yeah. So there's been some crazy stuff, you know, coming out of Congress, mostly by people that came from a generation that does not, that didn't understand you know, this is the Napster era, yeah, right? This is, this is when, you know, MP3s and that sort of thing and uh, just got, got started, and, you know. And this is long before anybody dreamed of, you know, uh, you know, you know the, the, the music services that we have now. And people didn't really understand, you know, how this whole thing worked, you know. Uh, there's like, there's some, there was one joke about, you know, Somebody said something about turning on the internet or how do you turn it on or whatever, you know, where's the switch, you know? Uh, and, but the laws were made by people like this, right. That, that, that didn't really understand. And so what they had was a lot of industry flax that had their own, just like, you know, that's how the sausage gets made today. You know, they come in and write legislation and hand it off to them and say, Hey, enact this as a law, you know? Uh, and so you get a lot of crazy stuff. You know, um, I don't know that anybody uh, obeys that rule anymore. The three song rule. I so I forget who passed away, but I I did a down on my show and came out. I did a uh, maybe I shouldn't be saying this, but I, I did a show where I, I played like an hour of, you know, somebody's music. I don't know what's wrong with that. I don't know why that would be bad. But <clears throat> because the thing is, is nowadays and uh, even back then, I mean, you could just go out and get, you know, they, what they were, they were still concerned with home taping. So you probably even haven't heard this phrase, but there used to be, uh, like, um, a lot of the music companies like Warner and the big, you know, the big music companies at the time had this whole home taping is killing the music industry. So when I say home taping, that's like making a mixtape with a cassette. Right. Or copying your LP to a cassette so you can listen to it in your car, you know, instead of going out and buying that cassette. Right. So that was the impetus for that, that all that, you know, they didn't want people to tape three songs of Bob Dylan off, off, off the radio. Right. Because that would kill the music industry or so they said, you know. Meanwhile, here's Spotify and here's, well, Apple Music. Right. This is pre Spotify. This yeah. is this is this is all that, Well that, yeah, cassettes. That. Yeah. Like I said, Napster, which that was like the first one that did that. And they, they, they definitely did not pay royalties. They you know, they just uh you could rip anything from anywhere and stick it up there and people could then copy it and put it on their computer and have it on their hard drive. I mean, they prosecuted people for having music on their hard drive. And that was not that long ago. You know, that was probably 10 or 12 years ago. They, they would raid, they would raid somebody, right? I remember reading about them raiding some guy who had like 3,000 songs on his hard drive, you know, and, and then hauling the poor slob off to, off to jail because he's, he's a scofflaw and he's, you know, killing music, you know, somehow by having these songs on his computer, you know. Well, that's a tale as old as time. The idea that lawmakers aren't up to date on 90% of what they're making laws about. My biggest gripe with that today is privacy and social media. The laws that they make are, are they're outdated at the time of signing. They don't do anything tangible. Yeah. Well, you know, it's just all industry driven legislation. Is, it's money driven. Uh, yeah. Who's got the deepest pockets. Right. And, and you know, these lobbyists are literally handing people, handing lawmakers, you know, model legislation, they call it. Right. And, you know, this is what we'd like to see in a bill. And by the way, here's $2,500 for your reelection your campaign, campaign yeah. you know, not connected to us asking for this model. Yeah, legislation. this is just on the side. We yeah. all, we want this in addition, but this money is really for you, yeah. for your campaign. So you get you get some kind of crappy legislation out of that right or you get legislation that suits moneyed interests that you know suits people who've got a you know that that really have a, a dog in the fight you know so uh, and not necessarily you know benefit 
the average citizen, you know. So, again, like you said, it's a story as old as, you know, time, you know. I'm sure back in the Senate in Rome, you know, there was probably, you know, hey, Claudius, you know. Yeah, I got, Same I, thing going I, I got on. some olive leaves, you know. Can you can you help me out? Grease yeah. some palms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you have a favorite medium then? Do you prefer the radio, even though there is that restriction, but it's not as heavy-handed? Or do you like the open access of the internet or cable? Well, I got to say I'm a radio guy. Uh, I mean, I, uh, I, I was always fascinated by the the fact that this just, you know, the voices came into your house, uh, for free, you know, and, uh, you know, I can remember as a kid, you know, listening to a transistor radio with it turned down really low and having it under my pillow and like listening to stuff late into the night and just being super fascinated with it. So I do come out of that, you know, um, but I, you know, I, I'm an all platforms person. I mean, the, the stuff that I produce, I pl- produce for all platforms. And uh, I think everybody should be doing that, right? Uh, the podcasters should have a, there should be a video component that you can put up on YouTube or you can put in Vimeo or you can, you know, do whatever you, you know, put it in some other sharing medium, you know? Uh, so I, I start off from a radio background. You know, like I said, I went, did radio and TV production in college, had a, had a college radio and then 20 years, 20 plus years at KHSU. Um, but I, you know, I am, I, 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 I did do some commercial. I, I, I sub for Mike Dronkers who used to be down at K, K hum for uh, a few times, did commercial radio and got a taste of that, you know? And, uh, I mean, there's a place in the world for that kind of for, for, for commercial radio, but I really am, I have long been focused uh, on on non commercial radio. I think it's just really important that whole voice of the people and and access and all that kind of stuff. You know, so well that f- seems to fit right in with Access Humboldt yep. as well. I mean, yeah. you're still in that same field. Yeah, still we're I'm, we're still heading in that direction. And even though you know I won't take anything for um, the radio station, I'll take almost anything. You know, I I. I <clears throat> I'm not going to go look at it and say, well, this is not, this is not something that I'm interested in. So I'm not going to put it on the radio because there are people that will be interested in it. Right. Uh, and I want to get people on that platform if that's what they want to be. Now, there are a lot of young people that don't even own radios, right? They don't even, you know, they maybe they have a car that's got one and they like, what's this thing? You know, I just, that's the Bluetooth machine. Right. You know, (laughs) but, uh, you know, there are still people that, you know, why I think radio is valuable or it's been valuable to me is that it's a multitasking sort of thing, you know, whereas things that are on video on television or on, on YouTube or whatever, it takes up your entire attention, but things like podcasting and, and, and radio shows and really a podcast is really a radio show without the transmitter, right? Without the tower. Um, you can, garden or you can you know do a craft or you can you know uh hang out on your deck and do uh, anything you can do anything uh while that's all happening and and you still get the benefit of that you know so that's to me that's kind of the beauty of it you know but i do i do love all these other things i have my i have a podcast um that i do with band and wayne who runs the uh the works here in eureka uh, it's called Low Pass Filter. Ah, oh, shameless plug. Little, little I got, plug I got, my, got my shameless plug in, uh, which is a, a show about music. And we we never hear any music, but we talk about music. And uh, so uh, that's a, a a television show or an internet show. And it's also designed to be on the radio and designed to be on like Internet Archive and stuff. You can listen to it as a podcast, a straight podcast. So, again, that's that whole all platforms thing. Now, did you have any gripes with podcasts when they first came on the scene? Because that seemed to be a big tension between radio guys and those underground podcasts when it first started. Not really. I mean, I, I it's a creative medium, and I I uh, I'm behind people who create. I I like to think of myself as a creative person. I'm a musician. I you know I I I do art. You know, and 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 stuff like that. So anything that's creative, anything that's an outlet for people. To me, I think that's that's valid and valuable, right? Uh, 
I mean, it didn't take away from us as a station. I don't really feel, and in fact, it's opportunities, right? So if, if again, if you have a podcast that you think would work on the radio, you know, I, I want to hear about it, right? So it doesn't just have to be a podcast. It's great if it is. It's, you know, that's fine. But you could also share it with a whole different audience who maybe would never never think of listening to a podcast and wouldn't even know how, right? And so uh, that's one of the, the cool things. So I never looked at it, no, as like it was something that was a co- uh, competition or anything else like it's that. It's all just exposure. It's yeah. not just putting out what you enjoy and hoping other people can find that. Yeah, and, and it, it's uh, frankly, it's a pretty low bar uh, uh, technology-wise uh, f- uh, to do, really. Oh, podcasts uh, especially. Yeah, yeah, you could just do it on your phone. You could do it on your phone. Uh, I mean, I suggest this to people all the time. You could do it with Zoom. Which people do. Which I I produce television shows using Skype. I had uh, Eric on. Eric, oh, I'm drawing a blank on his last name. Eric Black? No, Eric, he does the Redwood Wonk. I just had him oh, on yeah, Eric Kirk. Eric, yeah, Kirk. Yeah. was drawing a blank on his last name. Yeah. And he was using Skype. Yes. Yep. We Which, use, how easy is that? Yeah, you just I, need a computer. That's, a, a, show that I, that's a show I produce. Yeah, he was telling me about you. Yeah, uh, yeah. We, we the one of the, use, the reasons I use Skype. Skype is very weird, and it's it's kind of idiosyncratic, and I'm not sure it's super well uh, supported anymore. But the one beauty of of it is is you can get NDI video out of it, so that means I can go in and isolate the cameras. So if I you know because I cut back and forth, uh, I'll I'll use the interface, but I'll also cut back and forth the cameras. It's harder to do with Zoom. So, um, and the audio seems to be a little bit better most of the time, but yeah, I mean, for somebody who wants to do a podcast and let's say you have no gear, let's say you have just have a laptop, uh, you, all you have to do is just do a zoom session with your friend and, and record it. Right. And then if you wanted to go on and do like, you know, you could do, um, um, get audacity, which is a free, uh, audio edit editor that I suggest everyone get because that's what we're on right now. Oh, right on. It's audacity. Yeah. Uh, I use audition at work, but, uh, you know, I, I teach audacity to people. So, uh, but that's free. That's 100% free. It's ad free. It's, you know, and they update it. It's really amazing and amazingly powerful. Uh, but it also just does the small stuff, right? It, it also just, cuts heads and tails off, right? It just, you know, or, or takes out a bad word or move something around, you know? So, uh, it, it's at its minimum, you know, you, you, you know, you can really, there are other tools too, but I mean, it, it's, it's amazing that that's something that you, you have. I mean, I came out of, I was a recording engineer for 10 years and, uh, we use razor blades. I, I would do commercials for people and uh, we would cut in a voiceovers using a, a, a aluminum block and pieces of tape and razor blades. Right. And the fact that you can do this right on your, on your desktop computer is amazing, you know, and have in half no, the time. in half the time ha- and completely accurately and with complete fidelity, you know? Uh, so yeah, th- there's, the entry to doing podcasts is, is, is really pretty, pretty low. And really, again, it just comes back to wanting to do it and having to drive and just, you know, finding it important, you know. I've had a lot of people on here that have talked about wanting to start their own. And I'm yeah. always like, yeah, you should do it. And All I don't the know kids if, are doing it. I don't it. know if anybody has started, though. <laughs> They all yeah. talk about wanting to do it. I, well, I this know. gets back to my whole thing that I was talking about before about people that have grandiose plans and they want to do stuff and they would really, you know, they have good ideas and they really want to do something, but they just can't bring themselves to pull the trigger, you know? Um, and not to go too deeply philosophical or anything. Oh, but, we can go deep. <laughs> but, you know, you, uh, us as human beings, uh, I get this pointed out a lot, you know, as you get older is that, uh, you just don't know how long you got, you know, that's you, the big one. And why wait? Don't wait around because, uh, you just don't know if, you know, you or whoever you wanted to talk to say is going to be here tomorrow. You know, we, up at Keat, we did a, a series, uh, talked to tribal elders and we talked to people that had been in the community for a really long time. It's called Living Biographies. It's, uh, um, it was produced by a guy named Jan Kreppelin. And uh, the, if we had waited 
and in some cases, if we had waited, you know, a couple of months, you know, th- there's, their voices would have been silent forever. You know, when you die, it's the big silence, right? There's, you're not, you're not talking, you're not. So you, if, if you, you know, do it now, carpe diem, you know, I hate that Seize phrase, but you know, uh, but really what are you waiting for? You know, that well, exactly what are you waiting for? You know, just get out there and do it. And people just have, they self-sabotage and they, you know, they prevaricate around the bush and they, you know, uh, and then they end up not doing it. And they, and I think people have regrets about that. And you, that's another thing you don't want to have is regrets, you know? So, you know, do it now, you know, do it now. What's the worst that can happen? Well, exactly. And here's the other thing is, is like people think, well, I'll fail or it'll be bad or whatever, you know, but that's learning, you know, that you, the only way you get good at anything is by, by trying it out and learning from your mistakes, you know, and you're like, well, I won't do that again, you know, uh, or I like that. I like that bit. So I'm going to bring that bit back and I'm going to use that all the time now, you know, so that's how you find things that are super cool. Right. It's by making mistakes and trying it. And the old thing about, you know, if you want to have an omelet, you got to break some eggs. Right. You know, so um, if you're listening to me, if you're within the sound of my voice. Get out there and do it. Don't wait. And we can show you how at Access Humble. We, we can we can give you the tools and we can. And for twenty five dollars a year and for twenty five dollars a year. The classes are a little bit more than that. They, the classes are 40. Uh, but. One of the cool things about the classes that we that we give when once once we get back to giving them, um, is that uh, um, you could take them as many times as you want. So if you took a class and you didn't understand X Y Z or you just need a refresher or something, you can come back and take it again for free. Do you record the classes as well and put them out? No, no, I haven't done to this up until this point. It kind of makes me re- it would kind of make me redundant, you know. But really, uh, in, in you know, with with the way things are going, maybe that that might be a good thing. Um, <clears throat> especially like we used to give an orientation class, which is just basically an introduction to Access Humboldt. Talked about some of the you know um, our our policies, like we've been talking about today, um, and why you know putting it out there is important and all that kind of stuff. That could be recorded. I think that could easily be something that uh, people could just like webinar, you know, just, you know, watch it on their own. And it doesn't necessarily, uh, but the thing about that, about not doing it live is that's a chance for interaction, right? So that's a chance for us to interact with you to figure out what it is that you want to do, you know? Uh, and so that can be really important. So there's something to be said for doing, doing them live, I think. There's definitely that human interaction there that is valuable. Now, you mentioned that exposure seemed to be kind of an issue for Access Humboldt and that your media peers weren't exactly uplifting. Is that a competition thing? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Although, you know, uh, we do a show with uh, North Coast Journal called North Coast Journal Preview. I produce that show as well. Um, And they have been really great you know um they um we do a weekly show with them and we talk about what's in the journal and uh and that's terrific you know i i I really love uh jen and and um and thad you know um and um they're they're just you know fun you know and interesting right so and that's part of what we call our news block you know so we have um twice a day on weekdays we 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 try and get news, do a news. We don't have a news department, so we don't need, but we aggregate. Okay. So there we are. Uh, we, Full we, circle. Yeah. We aggregated, we aggregate some, some news sources and that's one of them. But yeah, it just seems like, um, yeah, we just, uh, we just don't get any, we're, I don't know. We just don't get any exposure. We will like, we opened our community media center and nobody, Nobody did a story about it, right? When we moved down to CR, we didn't, nobody said, but like, there's just a lack of curiosity on, on some people's parts uh, about it, you know? So, uh, I guess that's okay. I mean, it sounds like I'm complaining and uh, whining. Well, maybe. It I'm, sucks in the aspect that it's the community that loses out. Yeah. Cause they're the ones that can take advantage of what you guys were offering. Yeah. 
Yeah, it would be nice. And uh, the the experience that I often had and still do have um, uh, at Access Humboldt is like, I, I would people people would come in to do something with somebody who like to shoot something with a member or something like that, and they'd walk around going, "I had no idea this was here," you know. I had no idea, you know. I I had seniors at Eureka High School who would come in for something. We did this thing um, for a show, another show I produced called Community Voices. Uh, we had Jared Huffman, and uh, we had. Um, um, Paul Bursu, who was a... He's the host of Community Voice. Yes, I've watched a few of those. Yeah. 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 He, well, he is a legendary uh, civics teacher. I had him uh, as a teacher yeah. for AP. Yeah. People people love him, you know, and he was just like a different kind of teacher, right? He's a different kind of guy. He's a beautiful man, but he, you know, he he's not like, let's open our textbooks, right? It's more like, well, what happened in the news today? And let's talk about it. Oh, right? he can get rolling. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but he had his uh, uh, some of his seniors come and and ask questions of of Jared Huffman, you know, and uh, of like a, a number of them said, I've been going here four years and I had no idea that ac- that this was here. I had no idea any of this was here. Right. And, you know, it's not from our lack of trying, you know, it's not from our trying to put it out there. Uh, they have these things called link tours. I don't know if you did, if you, when you went there, when you were, went from junior high school to high school. Where, I was a link leader, yeah. Yeah, so. And I, to be fair, I didn't know you guys were there right, throughout my because duration. they never just. put us on the tour. And so Sean and I would go out and hijack the, 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 the groups of kids, you know, and say, come on in here, you know. We got candy, you know, whatever, <laughs> you know, uh, come in and check out the, the, the place, you know, just, just to try and, you know, so people will know and just say, hey, look, as you go through your academic life here, you know, that was one of the things about being at Eureka High School was the studio was dedicated to students during the day, right? They always had first call on, on so if they wanted to do an assignment for history or whatever they were doing, they always had first call on the gear there, right? So, uh, but there are kids that went through high school who never knew that any of that existed, you know, so... It's a struggle, even with people that are, you know, supposedly your allies, you know, uh, I mean, they've got other priorities. I understand they, they've got, they've got a business to run or they've got a school to, you know, build a new multi-million dollar gym on or whatever, you know, they, they're doing, uh, you know, so I understand, uh, that, 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 that their concerns are not necessarily our concerns and stuff like that, but, when you have a resource like that, it just it just really seems like a huge waste that to to not uh, you know avail yourself of it or you know at least know that it's there and you could avail yourself of it if it was of some use to you. You know, I'm not suggesting that everybody needs to come to an access humble and do stuff, but um, it could potentially be useful somehow. You know, so is that what happened with EHS? Was it was a sort of allocation of resources that they no longer wanted to provide? Well, I don't want to go too deeply into that whole thing, but I'll just say that um, they, they talked a pretty good game about us being important to them. And, but I didn't really, didn't really pencil out. And then, uh, and then when COVID hit, um, they, they kept the media program going for a while. uh, But after uh, people started coming back to school, then they, they killed the media program. Uh, media production program. Uh, so we kind of became redundant, I think, at that point. Um, you know, they, I shouldn't, I shouldn't talk, I shouldn't talk about what I think about education and how people conduct themselves in, in education, but it just seems like a lot of it is really ed- edifice education. It's like, well, let's, let's build stuff, you know, uh, whereas things like, you know, they got rid of the school newspaper, you know, they got rid of, there was a media club on campus um, and uh, they couldn't get an advisor for it. Well, part of that was, you know, teachers don't want stuff heaped on them that they're not getting paid for. And I'm down with that. That's completely. But I offered to do, to like be the advisor, you know, for, for the media club, but they wouldn't do that either, you know. So I, there was just sort of a lack of commitment, I think, to what we do. And I also think they, Again, this whole thing about not completely understanding, you know, the value of it. I mean, to me, and this is my elevator speech that I, I would give to people was that, 
you know, at, at some point in your working life, there's a pretty good chance that you might be asked to put together something, right? You might be asked to run a Facebook page that includes stuff like video. You might be asked to, to do a video about a company that you work for or what have you. And boy, wouldn't it be great to have that, you know, those chops before you, you know, uh, before you have to do it, right? Uh, and at least know that you could do it. If somebody asks you, you know, in a job interview, hey, could you could you put together a podcast about our beauty products, you know, and stuff? And I'm like, yeah, absolutely. I I learned that at school in media production and Access Humboldt, you know. Uh, but I don't really think that people completely understand that. I mean, there's uh, and then there's also the whole thing that's like everything is college track, you know. It's just like. So things like the arts and music and you it know, all takes a hit. Yeah, it all takes a hit. Yeah. Um, you know, fortunately they still have a music program. Fortunately they still have a theater program. Nan Voss. Awesome. I mean, shout out to Nanette. She yeah, was, yeah. Uh, I did a play there and she, directed yeah. us. she's fantastic. Yeah. I just did a kind of as my parting gift to uh, Eureka high school and to Nan and everybody. They did just did once upon a na- uh, mattress. Uh, the play Once Upon a Mattress, musical. And uh, <clears throat> so I did, uh, I videotaped the whole thing and made it, you know, so like you could, um, you know, watch the whole thing from beginning to end. And it, it, because it's copywritten, they, they just gave it to like parents and, and, and students and stuff like that. So it wasn't like you could, you know, get it widely. Um, but I also did this behind the scenes thing which I, I was there at rehearsals uh, for a while and, you know, just kind of put together what it took for like Nan and the kids and stuff to put the, the, the show together. It's just like kind of a fly on the wall uh, at, a, at a production. Um, and that was kind of my gift to, to Eureka High School because they did host us for all those years. And, you know, that's a thing, you know, that, that, that is a valuable thing. And, you know, I, I you know, I don't want to sound like I'm talking disparagingly about them because, you know, um, they gave us a home for a long time and, you know, it, you know, it was a good home and, uh, you know, all things must end. And, and in some ways, you know, like I was talking about leaving Keat, you know, that was the, at the time it seemed like a tragedy, right. But it turned out to be the best thing that ever happened to me. Really. I, if I had stayed there, I, you know, I, I pro- I would never have gotten to do all the things that I've gotten to do. And I I kind of feel like if they hadn't have uh, uh, ne- not renewed our lease, shall we say, um, you know, that we wouldn't be at CR. We wouldn't be in this really fabulous facility now. We wouldn't have all the opportunities that I think we're going to have to work with the people on CR to this morning, just as an example, this morning, um, I, I've been talking in talks with them about broadcasting the, uh, CR football games, the home games. That would be cool. I think it's going to be cool. We need to find some money if anybody out there wants to underwrite CR football on the radio. So, um, but anyway, we were up at the Redwood Bowl, uh, which also sadly has no football. The HSU football or Cal Poly football team is no longer a, a thing anymore. So they have this big, beautiful, empty stadium up there. So CR is going to be playing their home games up there while their stadium is being renovated. Uh, but anyway, so w- this is one of the things that uh, that we're working on doing is bringing that to uh you, you know the, to our listeners and and you know we also stream we have a um, you know you can you can stream us so you know like people whose kids are playing in in football games can you know if they're down in LA or if they're in Ohio or wherever you know they can they can they can tune in you know so you know a lot of, uh, these are opportunities that we wouldn't have had if we had still been at Eureka High School I think it's a better move I think it'll pan out to be if it's not already i think cr will be a better spot especially with the you might lose some of the community members that would go to ehs they might not travel that far but i think the college atmosphere at cr will be better suited i think those kids will actually take advantage of the resources and these kids are for the most part they're adults yeah so that's yeah we keep saying kids they're my age or younger but in you know late teens early 20s yeah and they might be more inclined to actually produce something They've got the energy. They got the drive. Yeah, they have the ideas. Um, I ran into a young lady who's doing work study uh, program. She was out 
like trimming the bushes and stuff out in front of our thing, you know, and, and, and she's like, oh, well, what's going on in there, you know? And so I started to explain to her what Access Humboldt is, and I was telling her about the podcasting classes, and she says, you know, we have this podcast that we we can't seem to finish, you know, which she's in a forestry student, right, you know? And I'm like, we would love to have that, you know? Let us know how we can help you realize it. I mean, they had stuff recorded, and they're, you know, they just haven't gone the final... Last you know, little push. The last little push to put it out. You know, it's like we're here. You know, and you know, you you know, call on us. Take know? advantage of it. Yeah, yeah. And you know, one of the things that we want to do is be helpful. You know, we we want to help CR in its mission, and the students there in their mission. You know, which was what we attempted, and I think sometimes succeeded to doing at Eureka High School. You know, that was our aim was to, to, is to help them, their educational career be, you know, more enhanced and, you know, a, a better thing, you know, and we are definitely, uh, what, that's what we want to do at CR is just be as helpful as possible and, you know, try and, you know, um, help them achieve their goals, you know? Yeah. CR gets a lot of slack and I don't know if that's just the local atmosphere towards it like from kids that are looking at colleges i feel like there's an air of oh you don't want to go to cr but it's a great community college i mean the teachers there the resources are really fantastic first of all it's beautiful oh yeah the campus Uh, itself is amazing i i i happen to live on the uh, up above cr on the hill oh so you've got the view up there. i can walk i can walk to work how nice is that it's it's pretty cool but you know like i at um you know i shouldn't denigrate kids at Eureka High School, but, you know, they can be boisterous and, you know, kind of a little out of control. Well, they're high schoolers. They are high schoolers. Yeah. Uh, And with COVID, they're actually junior high schoolers, you know, so because they haven't been to school in two years. But um, but anyway, uh, you know, when I would leave or go out outside, it would usually be students, you know, screaming obscenities at the top of their lungs. And, And then when I go outside at CR, it's like a a doe and two fawns, like, you know, noshing, on, noshing on the grass, you know? So it is kind of a different, a different vibe, I, I guess I would say. But yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot of opportunities and, um, you know, I can't say enough about Keith uh, Flamer, who's the college president, who's, who really has been welcoming and just really affirming on all the stuff that we want to do. And I think he, I think he has the vision thing, you know, I think he, he understands the value. Of course he's on our board, which um, helps. It does help. Yeah. yeah. He's uh, got that inside look. Of, okay. This makes a difference. Yeah. So it helps, you know, to have somebody at the top who who's behind the concept, you know? Yeah. It's always nice to have somebody on your side in a position like that. Yeah. I mean, look, thank God you spent. And he's a great guy. He's, he's really a super nice man. He's a really, really nice man. Yeah. All right. Well, Matt, we can, we can wrap this up. We've okay. Been, we've been putting in All some right. time here. Do you want to plug again, where people can find you, where they can find your podcast, yep. Access Humble? All that good stuff. Sure, sure. Yeah, so accesshumble.net. So um, the, everything's there. Uh, it's our webpage. Um, we also, there is a kzzh.accesshumble.net. That's the radio station page. Um, and uh, you can call us at 707-476-1798. That's our phone number. Uh, and if you wanted to get a hold of me, my uh, email is pretty easy. It's my first name, Matt, M A T T, at accesshumble.net. And uh, I just encourage people to come and just come down and take a look, you know, and see what we have to offer. And uh, I, I just had a lady in yesterday who wants to do podcasting, and she's got a broadcasting thing. And I sat down and we went through uh, aud- um, audition, and I showed her how to how to do it. And she when she basically levitated when she left the place. Oh my gosh, I can do this. It's like, oh my, you know, just the realization, you know. So hopefully we can help uh, people realize realize what they want to realize. Yeah, I think it's great. I've, I've said it again, or I've said it before, I'll say it again. I think the resource you guys provide is important. And I think the Thanks. ability yeah. for community members to just take advantage of that and the low barrier of entry you bet. Is, is just fantastic. Yeah. I think it's really important. Yeah, man. All right. Well, Matt, thank you. I I had a great time, man. Thanks, Nick. Thanks for coming on. Right on.